Hey, welcome to the Animal Rights Show. And I've got to get rid of some sound first. There we go. Evening all. Morning. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, morning. Others. Evening. Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is a global program. Evening. Global. Afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we from? It's tomorrow in Australia. Ah, it's tomorrow in Australia. Yes, yeah, tomorrow <laughs> in Australia. Oh, that's hmm. clever, isn't it? Is it, is so it yesterday you, somewhere else? Yeah, is it? Probably, it is, probably. It has, actually is. It probably mm. is yesterday somewhere. So we're we're embarking on a um, possibly going to end up being two or three weeks of looking at the issue of climate change, or um, we we call it the climate catastrophe on the grounds that it seems to be getting rather serious. Although there is still quite a lot of um, denial going on in in those terms. So, as you can see, we have with us uh, two guest panellists. So, Pamela from Animal Justice Emergency. Hello. Hiya. And some other, some other, some other geezer. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> that, 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 that way. That should be that. It should be that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> see, I've, I've had that before. We should, we should have Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix do that for you, for you Ronnie. It's quite some years ago, quite some years ago in Rome, someone done that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but is that the good one? We can never work out if that's the good one or the or the bad one. <laughs> the thumbs down. Probably bad, is it? It's like, like you know, do you? Right. I, did, I didn't realise you were that old, though, Ronnie. <laughs> oh, so, well, um, see, I'm nearly as, I am nearly as old as you, Roger. Now, <laughs> <laughs> nearly. So uh, what we're going to do, and obviously it's very related, is the, the last time, because we, we had a week off, and then thank you everyone who kind of tuned into my academic thing that I did last week, but um, we had a report from um, Nella to start the last Animal Rights show about what was going on in, in Greece and elsewhere, <clears throat> and we're going to have a bit of um, an update um, uh, Nella, so would, if you'd like to start, and I, um, I've got some photographs which I'll just show on the screen, and you can comment to that as as you wish. Yeah, so uh, we didn't, uh, we could not show any uh, graphic uh, pictures, as you can imagine, there are plenty of them, but we decided not to. So these are uh, pictures of other animals trying to escape from from, from the flames. Yeah, so this is the first um, one, I believe, yeah. This area is already burned. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to report that uh, uh, three weeks after um, the fires are still raging, we have fires in different areas. Some some days, sometimes the, the same fires are uh, going on for days. Uh, they cannot be controlled. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a catastrophe and what gets me is that um, uh, everyone, as you can imagine, everyone here is talking about the fires uh, like all the time, but very few people talk about uh, the climate crisis and even fewer people uh, talk about the, the link, the relationship between the climate crisis and animal agriculture. And as you can imagine, these uh, people are only uh, animal rights activists. So uh, today's topic is, is very interesting. Uh, for me, because um, we will raise the question how we can talk uh, about the, the climate catastrophe uh, without being too anthropocentric. Uh, Anella, did you get to the bottom, bottom of the thing about um, there was a bit of a question mark last time whether it was arson or not? Did, has that uh, been resolved? Uh, uh, not yet, because people have been arrested, but uh, we have to wait for, for the, the procedure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, s someone else was arrested uh, yesterday, so uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the reasonable conclusion is that some of these fires start started because of arson. But uh, I would guess that they would not be that large or that catastrophic uh, without... Uh, uh, the, the weather conditions, because uh, fires in, in, during the summer is not unusual. I will have them every year as long as I can remember, but uh, they were never like this. No. And did, did you and, take these photographs, Nella? 
no, 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 no. This, uh, these are photographs that uh, were on, um, I found on social media by the volunteers uh, that first and, and journalists that arrived at, uh, at the burning areas. And um, all, all kinds of other animals uh, paid the price. I mean, um, um, free living beings, of course, uh, especially snakes, turtles, animals that are not fast, uh, animals we breed, we, we mean, as humans, um, like the, the individuals on this picture, uh, that usually are, are not able to, to escape if someone uh, doesn't open the door to free them. And uh, also many horses, especially in areas with uh, horseback riding clubs, and uh, even dogs, dogs, uh, uh, not only stray dogs, uh, dogs that were chained in, in backyards, and uh, stray dogs and cats. I mean, I don't think that any species were spared. No, you also mentioned, because um, I noticed with the, apart from the deers, um, these, these other animals, they seem to be fenced in. Presumably that's why they were there, right? Yes. So, so they were, see, I don't understand that. I mean, even if you can't take them, at least you could free them to give them a chance, couldn't you? I mean, that, that uh, just, you know. in, in many case, cases, that didn't happen. And uh, uh, it was very disturbing because you, uh, you would read that uh, the, the fire approaches an area where a thousand sheep uh, live. So, uh, I, I mean, how we can free a thousand sheep like in an hour or so? And uh, the, the second question is uh, for the owner of the sheep, uh, uh, were are they willing to do that? Okay, yeah, because other animals are property, they're hoping yes. that it's going to miss them and they can come back and reclaim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, mm. speciesism strikes again. But I think another point is that, you know, these are larger animals that we're seeing, isn't it? Yes. What about yeah. all the sort of small birds and smaller, you know, reptiles and insects and mammals and every, everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because there must be so many of them. It's, mm -hmm. it's just absolutely horrendous. Yeah, these, and you these said are the real... actually... I was going to say, Sorry, that, I mean, th th these are, are kind of um, the main victims of these things. You know, we hear about how these fires affect humans, and that's that's horrific. Um, but it's massively more horrific for, for other animals because it's the same as the whole story, really, of the climate crisis. It massively affects other animals, particularly free-living animals, uh, more than humans. I mean, it's something that the human species mm. has done to other animals and it's part of human imperialism, mm. um, how, how we've dominated and oppressed other animals that now this is, you know, this yet yeah, something else that the human species has imposed on them, the climate crisis, which is wiping them out already in billions. And we need to remember that it's the focus that always seems to be on the human as in everything. And in fact, it's other animals who are the main, by far the main victims of the climate crisis. And I'm, and actually, when you hear the reports, like even when you hear reports of like fires or flooding or any kind of um, environmental damage on the news, they always report like the death toll, but they only ever really report the human death toll. And I always wish that they would just, you know, include everyone who's, and I know they can't include every individual, but at least give an indication of what is happening to all the other non-human beings that are that are living and being affected and it just really frustrates me and i think that's maybe part of our role as advocates is to make sure that these stories are brought into the light and to raise awareness and to put out the pictures and put out the stories and be on the ground as allies and and bring their experiences into the light because they're so invisibilized it's it's just horrific really and also to ask questions like why why are why is there no sort of contingency plan you know mm. these fires have not come out of nowhere you know, people knew that they were happening. Why don't they have some sort of a plan? You know, like Roger was saying, to sort of like open the gates or fences or, you know, why aren't trenches built? I mean, it's just, it makes no sense whatsoever. It shows how un unvalued, you know, the lives 
of the being the other beings are it's just yeah sex is uh, speciesism rampant mm. yeah definitely indeed well um We've got 13 tuned in, so hello, folks. So we've got a few in the chat. So if you want to say hello, you can do it. You can do it there. Uh, just uh, I think so. We've got Deb, uh, Jennifer, Michael. Michael was well ahead of everybody else today. I, I noticed. So um, well done there. <laughs> he, he, he was he was here yesterday, Michael, waiting. <laughs> <laughs> race race lever, uh, Deb. So hi, everyone. So um, yeah. So um, I don't know if anybody. I think Ronnie, you 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 saw the the Mo, um, George Mo, Mombio um, thing that I posted uh, today, yes. and yes. I, I also posted the um, Steve Best um, one. I mean, the the one I always post from Luxembourg is um, his Total Liberation talk. But at the same time, yeah. he did one about the ecological crisis and veganism, which is well worth watching as well, um, and. It, in a way, it's quite uh, depressing, or at least challenging, because he's basically saying that um, things have got so bad now, it's a question of are things going to get bad or are things going to get terrible? And so, you know, this is the idea that, you know, a lot of the tipping points have gone already. And so um, it's funny, though, isn't it? You know, like the, the way that human beings are, I sometimes wonder, you know, we we make so many claims about, about ourselves, about how rational and everything we are. You know, I suppose as, as long as the, the electricity works and as long as you, your toilet flushes and as long as the, you know, the premiership's back on the on the TV or something, it nobody's going to take any notice until those things have gone, it seems to me. Because you, failure, you, you know, you, I was going to say, it's failure to see things at a distance. I mean, this is, you know, in many ways where we've got the climate crisis, that people are aware of immediate threats and react to immediate threats. But something that's a bit further away... They don't take any notice of and that that applies in in lots of ways like people in other countries what's happening to them oh we're not bothered about them it's just kind of my little life that matters and the things that's around me and it's the same and it's the same in time if something's not going to happen for oh some years in the future well let's not worry about it and and this is this is a, a problem that seems to be kind of endemic to humans that this failure to see things at any distance from what is immediately in front of us. Well, I mean, not us, because I think we do, but most most, most humans seem to be like that. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. It's almost like a really short, short-term thinking, immediate gain, immediate kind of... Um, not, just, not just the problems, but also immediate pleasures as well. People are so set on what's immediately in front of them in terms of pleasure or pain, they don't really think much beyond that I think and but it makes it is surprising because often it's the people who have got children who are then going to have children who are going to have children perhaps who don't seem to think about that you know what what they're kind of leaving for for their descendants whereas you know some of us might not have to worry about that so much and yet we're the ones who do worry about it which is quite <laughs> that, that's true really, isn't it? But, but, but politicians play into this because they it, it, you know that, that they they deal with very short time frames because they know that people don't think very far ahead so they themselves only kind of you know propose things that are, are going to be a, a, a sort of effective in the short term and there's no long-term thinking and this this is why we've got the climate crisis in many ways because of lack of mm -hmm. long-term thinking from you know an action from politicians but it's more than yeah, that isn't yeah. it it's like it's convenient isn't it i mean that's the, that's the end of the day it suits the sort of like neoliberal system and all of us that benefit from that to to you know not make changes i mean that's fundamentally you know it works it works for those of us you know in the rich countries in the the well it works for us in the rich countries to a greater or lesser extent so hey pamela i was, I was open a book to, to see how long it would take you to say neoliberal. <laughs> <laughs> she done quite well with that. She said, how long have we been going? Well, I oh, think oh, it's, oh, you know, like, like everything is <laughs> needs to be seen in the context of systems, really, rather than in, in, in terms of in, as well as individuals. But I think, you know, you need to look at systems, systems type of thinking in order to understand what's actually going on. And that's, you know, where, you know, neoliberalism and catastrophic climate breakdown are all systems you know, into which the individuals also play, play a part. But if we don't look at it from a systemic point of view, um, 
we're just wasting our time, aren't we? And I think that's why it's really important to talk about, you know, catastrophic climate breakdown in the context of animal liberation, animal activism. I think yeah. Where do you think, uh, that's uh, a general question, I mean, a few years ago, I would say back, I would say that uh, when people see um, uh, the consequences of the climate crisis near them, close to them, they will start thinking about that. But then uh, at this moment you have half, half the Europe burning and the other half drowning in floods. So um, this is like happening um, near us and yet people don't realize what, what uh, this is, what they're experiencing. But it's nowhere on the media. I mean, it's not. I mean, I haven't. I don't watch mainstream media, but I don't know how sort of accurately it's and how much it's being covered on mainstream media, you know, or whether it's the usual sort of rubbish of uh, football and uh, you know reality TV and you know all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's and it's also like what what are the politicians saying? What are the polit political leaders saying? Well, they're ignoring it as well. You know, Boris came back from wherever he was for uh, what's crisis talks on Afga Afghanistan, but what about crisis talks on catastrophic climate breakdown? No, because it suits the system. There's more, I've noticed a lot more talk about the climate crisis in the media recently, because I always used to be very shocked at how little it was in the media, considering that many, uh, in the UK, many councils had, had announced climate emergency. And I'm not sure about other countries of, of what their position was, but I, but for, for decades we've been talking about this climate crisis. And I always used to think, how come we're in such emergency and no one is talking about it in the media? And yet recently I feel it's been a lot more spoken about a lot more reports a lot more obviously with with the different extreme weather that's going on across the world as well there's been a lot more uh, a lot more reporting on it so it does seem to be going more that way that people are talking more about it but i think sometimes individuals feel helpless or they don't know what to do they just feel it's too big and so in a way that overwhelms them so they shut down sometimes i feel that goes on as well are you talking about new news news bulletins uh, wendy or um documentaries or both or uh, so Sky, uh, Sky News reports, um, reports in the media online, reports on the radio, in the news items, and people are coming on and talking and interviewing people who are involved in in reports about climate change. So I've I've heard it a lot more just in the last couple, two or three months. But I think that's the XR effect, isn't it? The Extinction Rebellion effect. You know, that, that sort of whatever one thinks about XR, and I think they've actually got more radical, which is great. Um, you know, that they kind of raised the issue. They sp basically spent three years sort of like doing different kinds of actions that have raised the profile of catastrophic climate breakdown. And finally, there is some sort of traction within other media because it's like it's the, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of become a thing that people can actually have a conversation about. But even mm -hmm. so, the way it's covered in the media is still very much a sort of things that, you know, terrible things are going to happen in 2100 or in 50 years time, you know, something awful is going to happen rather than sort of like in five years time, we're going to have a blue ocean event uh, in the, in the Arctic. And uh, that's going to totally destabilize the jet stream, uh, which is going to be, you know, like massive, 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 massive problems to put it mildly, mm. you mm. know, in, as I said, in estimated three to five years, you know, this, the sense of urgency is still not really there. I mean, the other thing is that people, you know, people are obviously this is a really horrendous subject to talk about because you're facing not only your own sort of like, you know, fear and terror of death, of course, but you know, the extinction of everything that you've worked for, your family and friends have worked for, your society, all the presumptions about how you thought your life was going to be, you know, the legacy that you were or were not going to leave leave to your sort of like, you know, grandchildren or whatever. Um, and it's it's it is catastrophic for people to think about it. There is so much ca um, climate anxiety now. I was actually feeling quite badly over the last sort of week, just because of researching this um, this this stuff so much in depth, and it is really confronting. 
And I've been sort of aware of catastrophic climate breakdown for about seven or odd years. Before that, I was like, you know, campaigning for about 20 odd years. And, it, you know, it comes in waves, you know, and it, it, it's, it's really difficult stuff to handle. There's such a thing as climate anxiety. And loads of people are experiencing this, you know, because they just don't know where to put themselves. You know, there was a, a speech I watched the um, XR live stream yesterday. And one of the people that was giving a speech was a mum. And she was saying that her daughter has joined, who's about, I think she said eight, has joined the, some sort of thing that the youth actions or whatever it's called. And the daughter was sort of like saying to her mum, I'm just so tired of this. I'm so tired of this. I don't want to do it. And the mum was saying in her speech, well, what do I tell her? It was absolutely heartbreaking. You can totally get, I mean, you can totally get why people are in denial. And that's obviously why there's sort of like not a ton of people sort of like watching this. But at the end of the day, you know, denial will get you so far. But do we want to be, you know, well, clearly a lot of people don't want to be real. But do we want to try and make a bit of a difference and authentic? Mm -hmm. Mm. And actually, what, what interests me with this, and this might answer Paula's question, um, what is the point of this discussion? And I think what inspired this, this theme of the topic tonight was actually looking at how, as animal advocates, how do we, we convey and communicate in our advocacy the urgency of the climate crisis in relation to other animals. And this is what um, we wanted to talk about really is how do we put this across? Should we be talking about the climate crisis within our advocacy for animal liberation, animal rights? It's inter interconnected, of course, it, we can't separate the two out. And yet one thing that does worry me about this, and I'd love to hear your perspectives on this as well, is I, I'm concerned that if we talk about the violations of other animals, which are entangled, but we kind of put it into a human centric focus, like we say, you know, we we should be stopping these violations of other animals because it's polluting our uh, rivers and oceans. We're still putting that focus away from the actual inherent rights themselves, and that that the the things that we're doing to other animals are atrocities in their own right, regardless of the consequence to the environment. So I think for me, it's how do we get that balance of not distracting our advocacy with and with environmental issues and still being able to talk about inherent and moral and basic rights and respect and justice in its own right for other animals, other animals but not ignore but not ignoring of course the the connections and this is what interests me i think a lot of animal activists will see that have that reaction that's the that's the sort of go-to reaction for a lot of animal activists and that's not the framing that i'm using at all i've got a, a four point framing here and it's nothing to do with that at all it's about specifically looking at, you know, the time scale, the short time scale that we have in order to do anything effective, whether it's animal advocacy or anything else, because of catastrophic climate breakdown. Number two, the impacts on so-called farm animals, imprisoned beings, yeah? Number three, the impacts on free living animals. This is not in any order of importance, yeah? The impacts of catastrophic climate breakdown. And then how the animal death industry, number four, is um, actively working to put out piles of misinformation in the same way that, say, the tobacco industries or the oil industries are doing in order to stop effective advocacy on the animal death industry, what's the so-called meat industry. So, I, I mean, I don't know if that's sort of, you know, we'll go into it in a bit more detail, but it's specifically not looking at, you know, the impacts of you know slurry in, in rivers although that's obviously important yeah we, we've got a presentation coming just before we get to that i just want to bring this up which is really interesting especially pamela you talked about you know the time scale and kind of we don't have much time and everything and um i remember and i, I always was a bit worried about this but i remember when i was um, lecturing at ucd in dublin there was there was one there was one um, lecture where i i kind of suggested you know like isn't it interesting in the time of climate crisis that people are still having children, you know, and, and because if the climate crisis thesis was was true, their children wouldn't make it to be in adults, you know. But I kind of realise really that people are not kind of thinking in those terms, in terms of, you know, having kids and their future. And one of the things is I wonder whether what might feed into scepticism about, about it is... Um, one of, the, one of the films that I recommend a lot is called Home, The Home Project on YouTube. So it, it's it's home, you know, in capitals. 
And it's 90 minutes long. It's absolutely beautiful to look at, but it's got a very kind of devastating environmental uh, message. And yet at the end of that film, it says, well, we've only got eight, eight years left. And I think the film was about 11 years ago, you know. And so I think that a lot of people, you know, like if you if you get a kind of, well, we've only got this amount of time and then that goes. It's a little bit like the end of the world thesis and all that kind of stuff. You, you end up not believing it, don't you? Well, you only don't, don't believe it if you don't read the science, and the science is not difficult to understand. I mean, the science, you know, you can sort of, there are tons of sort of like, there's a good channel on YouTube uh, by a, can, um, a Canadian climate system scientist called Paul Beckwith. Very, very digestible stuff, 15 minute segments, you know, goes through it in very, very easy to understand terms, very sort of like non dramatic, you know talking about all this stuff there's tons of other you know just google climate change or catastrophic climate breakdown on youtube and you'll you'll find some good sources but it's like everything else you need to keep your finger on the pulse you need to sort of like get your basic understanding which is pretty simple and straightforward and then just keep yourself up to date you know and and most people don't want to do that they'd like to keep up to date on the sort of like the sports activities or their their sort of like celebrity heroes or heroines um and whatever they're sort of like enjoyable little side projects are and I completely understand why that is and that's why they don't believe that it's real but also because there's no traction again apart from as Wendy was saying recently with the media with politicians taking a significant and, and you know strong and proactive lead of course people are going to feel sort of caught between two places I, I'm not saying it you know people think of themselves as individual thinkers but they're not they just aren't I think more and more people, I think more and more people are, are um, accepting that it's real. And um, one way in, we increase that is by putting out information about it being real. Um, but going back to what, what Wendy said about, um, um, you know, animal liberation um, advocates um, being concerned about um, campaigning for um, the environment and campaigning um, to... Um, do something about the climate crisis being um, uh, human centric. Um, I think all we have to do is emphasize the harm that the that the climate emergency, um, climate catastrophe is 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 causing to other animals. And as I said earlier, it's causing far more um, slaughter and suffering to other animals, and will continue to do so than it is to humans. So, so combating the climate crisis is very much an animal liberation issue. It's probably, I mean, there are probably, uh, you know, we probably all consider that the um, the greatest area of um, of animal slaughter um, is the food industry. You know, we have fifty thousand animals every second slaughtered throughout the world to feed humans. But I think animals that, that, that suffer and, and, and die because of adverse human impact on the environment probably comes fairly close to that. It certainly would be the second largest area of the oppression of other animals by humans. And, and for a long time, I think that was ignored, you know, largely ignored by the animal liberation movement. But I think that's changing. And I think people are becoming more aware of that. And, and so we can campaign... Um, uh, we, we, we can campaign um, to, to, he to heal the climate, really. We can campaign um, against, you know, to stop the climate crisis from the point of view... I know, Ronnie, you, you are on your phone, so you can't see the full screen, but there is a comment here by Peter Davis. I'll read it out for you. Depressing yeah. how many animal rights activists are boycotting XR because it's not seen as a vegan organisation. So I think mm. that kind of speaks to what you what you've just yeah, said, yeah, yeah, and yeah. again, I, I think that's part of parcel actually of the fact that we've now got a a fairly reduced version of vegan flying around the, the, the you know we've got the animals only kind of version of veganism, and I, I think I think that that is feeding into this entire problem which we, we're we're bound to get onto in terms of of this conversation in a way because there's no reason why vegans can't be interested in the environment. I mean, that is the habitat of the other animals. Mm. You know, well, and, and, unless they're only concerned about domesticated other animals. And they wouldn't say that they were, I'm sure. So, Well, there are two points yeah. that I'd like to sort of put in there. Sorry. 
um, is number one, I was listening to the sort of speeches from XR's uh, opening event yesterday, and they've come up with this concept of um, co-liberation, where they're sort of like uniting, um, you know, catastrophic climate breakdown, ecological breakdown with various sort of like freedom struggles, you know, um, both human and they actually mentioned animals for a few uh, a few times, you know, and I think they're probably generally talking about free living animals, but at least animals were mentioned a couple of times, which I thought was a massive thing, you know, really important. They actually had speakers from Animal Rebellion. They had uh, Dora and some bloke who's an ecologist and the woman that I mentioned with the uh, the kid, I can't remember if she was AR or AXR or not. So I was very heartened by that. And I totally understand, you know, I mean, you don't have to join XR. You could all, if you want to, you, if you're minded to, join AXR, Animal Rebellion. You know, I mean, Wendy maybe could say something about that. You're muted, men, uh, Wendy. That's handy. <laughs> um, yeah, Animal Rebellion are, st <laughs> are starting um, a rebellion this week, actually. They started today. They run alongside Extinction Rebellion. That's going to be running for two weeks. So there will be a lot of, there will be a lot of actions going on. Um, the, the strategy of Animal Rebellion is very much plant-based food system, ju uh, justice for the food system. It is um, another animal focus, but it, they don't sort of advocate for rights as such. It's not an, it's not a rights organization and they don't really advocate for veganism as such, although most people in that organization are vegan and are animal rights people. The, the strategy is very different to run alongside um, the strategies of Extinction Rebellion. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of pushback on on the, the ethos sometimes from different activists, but you know that who knows if this strategy might be the one they get a lot of attention you know they're doing some great actions against mcdonald's i think sometimes things can look wrong alongside each other and have you know some some great results and and get attention and and draw a lot of activists in so we'll we'll see how how that plays out as well yeah right now uh, Ronnie joked um, just before we came on on air that this this might be a seven part series and we've just about done the intro so I think he might be right so let's um <laughs> let, let's let, let's put onto the screen what we're supposed to be uh, doing so this is a document um Pamela that you've um, put together so you want to take us through uh, this document and also it kind of goes to that four part thing that you just mentioned. So that's time scale, other animals, so called farmed, uh, other animals free living, and what climate washing, I think, was what we put as, as, as a kind of thing for that. So, yeah. yeah. So, do you want to make a, an opening statement or anything like that? Or, um, I just think this is really important. And that it's important to look at climate change, catastrophic climate change as a framing. And let's just crack on. So we've talked about the, the time scale being very short. You've got your feedback loops. All the science is saying, you know, scientists are saying it's faster than we originally thought. Once we've got the wobbly jet stream from the uh, Blue Ocean event um, some September in the next two or three years, Everything's up for grabs climate wise. Now, what that means is it's going to impact the environment, the, the, uh, the habitat. So the first thing I'm going to be looking at is free living beings. because I think people will be more familiar with the sort of like so-called farm, farm animals. And I'm going to be using some words you know, like farmed animals, which I'm not necessarily comfortable with. But sometimes it's just easier because of the complexity of the subject talk about that rather than things like the animal death industry so in terms of free living beings and um, we've got two elements that they'll be affected by with catastrophic climate climate breakdown is the habit habitat loss and the fact that they can't adapt and therefore they die and i'm going to be quoting here from um, a guardian article um, called baked barnacles scorch cherries the disastrous impact of heat waves on plants and animals by Gabrielle Cannon. So she says, uh, more than a billion sea creatures across the Pacific Northwest perished in this year's heat wave. More than a billion sea creatures, more than a billion. And it's just a taste of what's to come. 
when forecast foreshadowed the Pacific Northwest devastating heat wave at the end of June, marine biologist Christopher Harley was alarmed and intrigued. Then came the smell and his feelings somberly shifted. Quote, it was this putrid smell of decay, Harley said, across hundreds of miles of coastline. The extreme heat baked the barnacles, seaweed and small sea creatures exposed to the elements along the shore. Starfish that failed to crawl to shadier spots were cooked alive. Mussels lay agape along the rocks, the tissue crisped between their shells. Nowhere is safe. So Harley went um, to the beaches to measure the body temperatures of the mussels, but it was too late. By the third day, the third day, only the third day of this record-breaking heat wave, they had all died. Quote, we were just walking across carpets of dead mussels on the shore in awe, he says. And then it says, initial estimates show that over a billion creatures that live in the shallow waters across the Pacific Northwest perished in the heat that week. Over a billion creatures in one week. That's something to think about, I think. And that's just mm -hmm. an estimate. It could be tons more. Scientists expect the impact will have a trickle-down effect on the ecosystem <coughs> and the other animals that rely on those that died for food and habitat. So that is the whole kind of thing about these sort of like ecosystems. It's a system. So, you know, the barnacles and the mussels would obviously have been food animals for fishes and heaven knows what else. I'm not a biologist. And so once those populations collapse, you're going to get this sort of like knock-on effect of other animals over a period of time, both marine and non-marine, um, starting to collapse. So, yeah, that's kind of quite important, I think. Um, so the second part of this one um, is another scientist that was quoted. As, this, as the environment continues to warm, due to human-caused global heating. Spiking temperatures will become more frequent, more intense, and last longer. So these kind of disruptions are going to be, be worse and more frequent. Because heat and drought are inextricably linked, the compounding catastrophes that have plagued the West this summer will persist into the future, continuing to wreak havoc on ecosystems, infrastructure, and agriculture. So basically everything that Nella's been talking about, we've been seeing also in, in Germany with the floods, et cetera, et cetera. This is all going to be compounded and happening more. These are all ecosystems. Apart from everything else, they are ecosystems. We're free living animals, you know, from tiny sort of like insects and marine species and whatever, up to birds and others, all sorts of mammals and every, everyone else live. And when these systems are frequently disrupted, what on earth is going to happen to the free living animals? So this professor says, um, Jonathan Stillman, a professor of biology at San Francisco University says, animals are also struggling to adapt. And for some, the prognosis is grim. His re research shows that for animals that have already adjusted to higher heat, it will be even harder to adapt when the temperatures spike further. They don't have the ability to cope when the temperature goes just a little bit above the maximum they've adapted to, he said. They can't tolerate just a little bit more. This includes small birds living on the edge of their water needs, desert dwellers who have nowhere else to go when the nights fail to cool down, and fish that aren't able to reach the areas they spawn. And then this is a great example on the fish front. Spring-run Chinook salmon in California's Central Valley were decimated by the heat. After making a significant recovery following the 2018 campfire that critically diminished the already threatened fish, more than 83% of the roughly 15,000 adults in Butt Creek, the largest population of the federally protected fish in California, died according to uh, a senior policy advisor for the fisheries West Coast region. So those figures again, more than 83% of 15,000 adults of these Chinook salmon. And this bloke says, it is devastating, he said, calling this an indicator of the severity of the drought and heat wave. 
It is the largest loss of adult salmon we have ever seen in the Central Valley. Salmon in the Columbia River farther north were also documented swimming slowly and lethargically through the overheated waters with large red abrasions and burn marks. Let's just think about that. The fish had large red abrasions and burn marks. Now we know about these salmon because they're quite big and you know they're well researched. But what about all the smaller, the smaller beings? We know nothing. But what we can probably sort of assume is that huge numbers, colossal numbers of, you know, creatures like tiny fishes, tiny crabs, all sorts of beings. And, you know, maybe sort of little marine mammals as well. I don't know. But loads of them will be going to the wall. They have already gone to the wall. Pamela, so, while, you, while you were reading, sorry, uh, just want to ask, ask you something. Uh, you were reading this. I was trying to, to uh, imagine uh, what some, uh, some uh, non-vegan person uh, thinks about it. And the first thing that came in mind is that they would say, okay, we lost salmon, so what? Because um, we, we, we don't, I mean, as a majority, we don't uh, feel interconnected with other uh, species. And we're not aware that we are part of the ecosystem. So I, I guess that for most people, uh, reading about uh, small fish or small marine mammals, uh, they would, it would not scare them. Well, I mean, it, you may well be right. Um, and that is, I mean, the thing is, you may well be right, but a lot of people like to bang on about how much they love nature, don't they? Yeah. And there's this, there's, people are always banging on about, oh, I love nature. And there's all this sort of like rhetoric now, you know, with COVID, about how we all need to go into nature to regenerate ourselves. It's been seen like it's almost like this virtue signaling thing. Oh, yes, I, I love nature. This sort of like foggy notion of what nature is and how nature operates. And this really drives me mental because, you know, they may not actually be bothered about salmon, but they are kind of bothered about having somewhere probably nice to walk and, you know, nice trees with nice birds and, oh, that's a butterfly there. Oh, there's a bee, you know, so they're, they're, but they don't join it up. It's this, again, it's this whole mm. lack of sort of like systems thinking, you know, they don't connect the whole sort of like the, the crash of one species in one area, one population mm. with lack of food for other species. The whole, you know, the whole ecosystems, it's called a system because, you know, it's a system, it's a network. It's, it's, I think it's, I think you, but you've kind of both touched on something there as well, which I think part of the problem is this false divide of human, animal, nature, like we're all separate, like, every, but we're so interconnected. And yet we don't see, we separate out. So humans, are, there's humans, and then there's everything else. And it's, it's just so, it's, it's just creating so much havoc, isn't it? In, on the, on the earth, because we are separating ourselves out, but we're not separate. We're not separate from every other animal on this planet. We're not separate from nature. We're all part of it and we're interconnected. And it's like the fundamental underlying issue is this human supremacy and human exceptionalism that we have. And until we deal with that, and I think that's what we as animal advocates need to, to really challenge is human supremacy more than anything else, because and until we kind of dismantle this hierarchy that we've created, this is just going to keep going because it's like Nella said, people will look at the, the barnacles and the fishes and be like, mm, okay, so what? Because there's that sense that there's something less than, there's someone less than, than, than humans are. And until we kind of change that mindset, it seems that, and, and especially when people are in some kind of crisis, the other animals who find themselves very, very low down on the hierarchy are going to be the last thing that people care about in terms of helping and saving. It's going to be, oh, how can we save ourselves? We've seen that with the COVID pandemic. How do we save ourselves? Let's test and research this vaccine on other animals. Let's um, farm you know, horseshoe crabs to take their blood. Let's kill all these sharks to take whatever we need from them in order to save the humans. This is the attitude that we have to dismantle as far as i can see it is and yet, uh, sorry pal i was going to ironically of course the um uh 
in the same way as the climate uh, crisis, the root cause of the COVID crisis is human supremacism. It's because of the way uh, humans have treated other animals in terms of farming and in terms of um, the exploitation of, of, of free living animals. That's what that's what has caused COVID. That's what caused three out of four pandemics that affect humans. And so it's actually human and to, human supremacism is the root cause of the climate crisis as as, as well. It's our lack of consideration, uh, doing whatever we want without considering what the impact that is going to have on other animals, mm. and that is the root cause of the climate crisis. And what's happened is both those things have have, have, have come back to bite humans on the arse, haven't they? Like our oppression of other animals has come back to bite us. And and it's only when that happens that people start running around with their hands up in the air, doesn't it? I mean, I mean for instance, you know, this this thing about our house is on fire, you know, with the climate crisis. Oh, the, how, how the human house is on fire and we've got to do something about it urgently because our species um, threatens extinction. Is, 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 you know, we're in danger of becoming extinct. Well, how many other animal species have been made extinct because of, 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 of human activity? Hundreds, thousands. And where were all the protesters on the streets then? Where was the blocking of London then when those species were going extinct and those animals um, were suffering and dying, you know, because of human tyranny? It's only when the human is affected that we get all the fuss, and that's completely wrong. You know, we've this is this is our you know, you know, the human species is is paying the price now for what we've done to other animals, and and it would be okay if the ones that were responsible for it paid the price. I mean, they can they can burn, you know, they can die. You know, I don't care about them. The ones that are responsible, but I, I think it's you know, the shame is that that so many innocent um, humans. Um, Will suffer and die because of it, and and that's why obviously we have to we have to um, struggle to 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 do something about it, um, and of course for the other animals as well we have to do that. Do you know even the word um, Ronnie even the word environment I don't know if you've looked into the 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 kind of origins of that but even the word environment comes from the French environ which is environ a little accent um which means oh, around so i was just pissing <laughs> uh, um. but um but it, refer, but it basically when even the word environment places us as the subject surrounded by the environment so we still become the center of the environment because it talks about what we're surrounded by we, we, and what we exist within. So we're even at the center and the same with world, it's an old, old English word uh, from a Germanic compound, which, which basically means the age of man or human existence, human race, humanity, mankind, that kind of thing. So even the word world, I've started to kind of stop using the word world so much and use the word the earth rather than world because I find it, again, it's, it's placing humanity at the center of the universe as always so just a, a question that arises yeah. from all this is uh if which i believe the root of the, the problem is uh human supremacy and as we know as pamela is explaining we're out of time uh i guess we don't have the time to uh dismantle human supremacy so what do we do I mean, uh, we try to raise awareness and um, mobilize people, even if they do it for their for their own motives, even if their their motives are um, to to rescue the the human race. Uh, how how do we do we um, do we use this in in our advocacy? Uh, do do we have the luxury to try not to be? anthropocentric since we are out of time i think we have i i, I think i think we're able um it's very important to act together um with other organizations that are aiming for the same thing even if it might not be the same reasons like for instance becoming involved in extinction rebellion you know becoming involved in in 
you know, gr- groups that want to protect the natural world. And I think there's this 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 kind of two two ways of, of doing it. And I think those two things have to happen together. I mean, first of all, you know, put put in pressure on existing governments and existing authorities to um, to change things. You know, to do something about the climate crisis. That's the first thing. Um, but but secondly, educating ordinary people, you know, m- making people a- aware of what's happening, um, educate people to go vegan, because animal agriculture is a, is a is a huge part. It pay, you know you know plays a, a a huge part in 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 causing the climate crisis. It may even be the it may even be the major the major cause. Um. And so it's really important. Unfortunately, to... Ronnie, most most environmental groups don't even talk about that, do they? They don't. The next they don't. And, they don't, and they don't talk about. No, it's not up there in anyone's list. No, but but that's part of our them. job, isn't it? I mean, that's part yeah. of our jobs as, as advocating vegans. You know, which you, I know you sort of like talked about a bit, haven't you, Ronnie? It's like you know, it's get into these other groups um, and actually start talking about it. I mean, I did it in XR and with no great results. You know, when they started in sort of like you know three years ago. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean to say we stop having those conversations with other other non-vegan environmentalists. I think it's really important that we do. And, and you know, to to Nella's point about that we don't have time. Well, we can't possibly. You know, it's really difficult to advocate on human supremacy. Well, you know, we're in a time I think of great societal change. You know, um, and I think XR and Animal Rebellion and all sorts of other sort of like activist groups have now got together in this sort of like coalition. Um, and there will be more of a coalition for the COP, COP26 in uh, Glasgow in uh, November. You know, so I think it's, it's, it's a great time, actually, to advocate to these other groups, you know, and sort of start talking about human supremacism. You, you say that they, you know, and I feel that, you know, the leverage of the catastrophic climate breakdown crisis that we're facing might make people a bit more open to having their ideas sort of, reworked a little bit i mean i don't know and i'm not saying it would be easy but i'm saying it could be seen as an opportunity because people will be sort of really hoping or trying to people will be questioning some people not everybody some people will be really questioning the state they are questioning the status quo if we want people to see the world as it is we've got to describe it as it is you know, we've got to say say what it is. You know, it's it's like the emperor's got no clothes, isn't it? You know, we've got to, we've got to say. You know, the, the, all these problems are caused by human supremacism. Um, we have a situation where one, you know, where the human oppression of other animals makes the Nazis look like Mary Poppins. You know, in 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 relation, <laughs> not that they were, but in terms of comparison and the, in the amount of slaughter and suffering that's caused. In, you know, we are, you know, we are, the, the, we, we have a human right in the world that dominates and oppresses all the other animals. And that is the, that is the biggest social justice program, that, uh, a problem that exists, and the biggest social justice problem that's ever existed in the history of the world. You know, it should be number one on the agenda. Number one on the agenda of, of, of everything is, is to end uh, human supremacism to end the oppression of other animals. When you look at the number of victims, fifty thousand a second animals killed to feed humans. When we could all be vegan, you know, and, and then then the billions and billions that suffer because of adverse human impact on the environment. And then we have um, at least fifty million um, suffer and die because of experimentation. And so the list goes on. And that, that, that's got to be the number one priority of the human species is putting an end to that. You know, stop being oppressors. You know, our species has to stop being oppressors. And that means radical, radical changes to the way that, that, that humans behave as individuals and, you know, as, as a society and politically and everything. And we have to say, say it as it is. We have to... We have to say that the emperor's got no clothes. There's no other way of doing it. You have to use the right language. But, well, but you know, Ronnie, we, we come we come a little bit round to neoliberalism again and the culture of society. 
I mean, be, um, before before we we started this, um, the Vegan Songstress did a a TikTok um, live stream, which engaged um, seventy four thousand people in the end. But most of those people were completely selfish. You know, all all they came, all they wanted to say is how much they they love to eat meat and bacon and all the rest of it. And I know we can't use TikTok as a barometer of of, of things, but you know, there there is a major kind of problem. With the fact that even even though you've got you know vegan versions of just about everything, it's almost like they don't care. So, you know, it's it's all based on what they want as an individual. It's kind of like me, me, me. I mean, that's the overwhelming thing that you get when you get out of the vegan bubble. It's kind of well, I like it, you know, and I I love that, and I love bacon, and you know, this is what makes me happy. It's all about them. It's almost like they don't care about any, anything else. But I think this is why, this is exactly the reason why the concept that, as I said, that I saw in the XR speeches um, yesterday of co-liberation is absolutely fascinating because it sort of, it seems to me what they're kind of talking about is total liberation. What we as vegans would understand as total liberation, but they're framing it in a somewhat different way. They're calling it co-liberation. So therefore they had like speakers from the global south people talking about the sort of like a Haitian revolution, as I said, speakers from sort of like animal rebellion who are not, you know, like the most sort of, like, well, actually making some really good points, I have to say. Um, so I think this notion of co-rebellion, now you're not going to get everybody. Most people, as you guys have already said, you know, are not really that interested in anything, but you don't need every single person to be, in, you know, interested in perhaps going vegan. You just need a sort of a significant chunk of society to say, "Hi, hey guys, wake up, smell the burning bodies." You know, uh, this is the reason, and uh, you know we're doing it, and uh, you know, basically have a tranche of measures, both individual and societal and systemic, that will push those agendas forward. And societies are always in a state of flux, aren't they? Now, maybe they haven't always been in a state of. Um, I don't know if there were ever societies that were not human supremacist, but there may have been. You know, change is happening and change is always possible. I mean, you have to believe I, that, don't you? I think the other thing is, is, is that, you know, how many people do you need to create change? Mm. We have to remember that the, you know, we, we've got an appalling government at the moment. I don't know how to say too much about that. Elected by less than 30% of people eligible to vote. And that happens and they're able to kind of, you know, to, to, to rule and dominate and impose everything but that's all we need that's all we need need to have to have a to get a government in in power in this country that can take really radical measures to combat the climate crisis take radical measures you know to um towards animal liberation to to to, to get the population um consuming a vegan diet all these things we don't need to change everyone because most people just go along with it as long as they can watch Love Island. They just go along with everything, don't they? That's, that's sadly what you know, a very large number of people are like. So it doesn't really matter about them because they're just going to go along anyway. They ain't going to protest. Oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll just, as long as I can do my little thing, you know. So, so we don't have to change as many people as um, it, it, it might at first appear. But we have to work hard, you know, even so, you know, you're talking about and, and all those people that, that voted a decent government and, and like that, they wouldn't necessarily all have to be vegan, but just maybe sympathisers and agreeing with like most of what's put forward. But that, I mean, it's, it, it, it makes it more possible, but it's still a lot. And it means that, you know, that, that we as, as, as vegans have to work hard and, and, and what we really need uh, more than anything, is far more vegans becoming involved in outreach, becoming involved in education, so that we can do that, so that we can, you know, get the, you know, enough people educated that not only will that change things through how those people change their lifestyles and the, and the effect of that, but also um, it will um, create enough people to, to change things politically as well. This is a trouble, Ronnie. I was, and in fact, I was thinking about you yesterday because I was having a, a conversation about this with someone who um, had come to an event, an activism event, fresh from Vegan Camp Out, and they were inspired by someone who gave a talk at Vegan Camp Out to come to 
uh, do some activism and they were saying it was the I think it was one of the first things they'd done for other animals and um and I was saying, oh, how many people at Vegan Camp Out? Is that, oh, I think there are about 10,000 or something like that. And I was thinking, I wonder why all those people are not active. What is it? And I, and I actually asked him the question. They probably the all got COVID feeling? from each other when yeah. they, <laughs> it's, it's super, super spreader event, isn't it? That's the super spreaders. Yeah. 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 So I'm, and he was just basically saying, I think he got the feeling that a lot of people just feel like being vegan is enough and that it's already a radical step it's already and we've talked about this before on the show as well is it is being vegan enough because it is it is radical because you're always swimming against the tide you've made a big change but i think that a lot of vegans do feel that that it's like their their living vegan is is activism in its own right and so that they kind of stop there because if all those 10,000 people were to come from vegan camp out and then go to you know, come down to whatever Camp Beagle, go to Animal Rebellion, go to do some outreach, whatever it is that they're drawn to and they feel they can do. Leafleting, I know you talk about leafleting a lot, just just door dropping, leafleting, whatever it is, then we'd have a lot more, you know, feet on the ground in the grassroots, but it doesn't seem to work that way. It doesn't, it, because we were talking yesterday, oh, so everyone there was saying, I really feel like I need to be here, but I wish I could be free to go and do this as well. And we just feel like we're so we're spread so thin as activists that we have to try and do everything, and we can't. And it's it, if yeah, if we could just get more people active. Come on. I think a small Little number. Bob. Is that Bob Panner? <laughs> yeah, that's Bob. <laughs> a small number of people though that are dedicated and and you know perseverant and 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 keep going can um, you know can can achieve a lot. I don't think I think the majority of people who consider themselves vegan will 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 always you know remain non-active. I think that's uh, you know that that's uh, you know that that's very sad. But if we can get more, if we can get you know maybe ten twenty percent more of of, of vegans um, to become active, that would make a huge difference, and that would probably that would probably sway it. We'd, we'd, we're not going to get all of them. We just need to get as many as we possibly can. Well, maybe that's a reason to go to somewhere like Vegan Camp Out, you know, and uh, ha as a sort of like a little contingent and sort of give some talks about, you know, what you can do to get active and, you know, uh, how, how to start your active. I mean, I don't know if they do that already um, and how to start your activism journey. And are you, can you call yourself vegan if you're not an activist? You know, something like that. I don't know. I mean, why not? Yeah, I, I, I know Alan Rebellion put, like put on coaches. <laughs> they had uh, Alan Rebellion actually had coaches there to take um, people from Camp Out down to start the rebellion if they were inspired to do it. So I thought that was quite a good uh, recruiting method. <laughs> Get on the yes, coach. Good idea. Come on. Good we'll, idea. We'll take I, gave, I've, yeah. I gave a talk there in 2018 about the importance of vegans getting active. And then the following year, there was a workshop that I was involved in organising along the same lines. So, you know, there is a place where that kind of thing can be done. But how many um, take... I, I mean, I feel often... I mean, um, I'll, I'll give a talk, say, at a vegan festival. And there's people at the vegan festival that are going around looking at the stalls and all that. It's a consumer event, a spectator event. And I often feel that people come and listen to me talk and maybe there might be a room of 50 people perhaps more, uh, I often wonder whether they're kind of using me as just another form of entertainment instead of kind of taking anything away from it. I do often get that kind of feeling from it. You always hope that some people will take something away and be, be, become active. But it is very difficult, and I think we just have to keep trying. We just have to keep trying all the time um, to get to get more people active and to get more people spreading the message. I mean, what's there's, there's there's no real choice, is there? You know, we have to just experiment with different ways, you know. And, you know, I mean, Animal Rebellion, the great thing about them is like their organisational sort of um, nous, you know, they're very, very organised, you know, they're, they're sort of like, once you're on the email list, you're being constantly sort of like on a weekly basis asked to sort of like volunteer or donate or whatever. Um and they sort of like they've they've taken that template from XR. Now it not, might not be everybody's sort of like cup of tea. I don't think it's probably mine, but um, it's certainly one way of um, capturing sort of new people. 
And I think the other thing is just, you know, I mean, it must be, I can't imagine what it must be like for somebody like, you know, Ronnie or uh, Roger, who's been sort of like active for sort of like decades, you know, and sort of like going through these sort of like the same sort of conversations and trying to be advocates and, you know, giving talks and whatever since the year dot. Um, but, you know, you just, I mean, we all have to be like that. We all have to have that sort of perseverance to just sort of, what is the alternative? There's not one really, is there? And I do think that now is a moment, societally, where we might be get more of a hearing. I really do. This concept of uh, co-liberation, I found, as I said, really fascinating. Mm. Do we have time to, to go into Pamela's third section, Captive Beings, or do you think? This one's quite short. It's very oh, short. Yeah. Right, so I'll just go into it. Um, so basically, I thought this, I'll keep this one sort of like short because, I mean, I think most people sort of like really get the sort of like the so-called so farmed animals situation. Most vegans are most vegan sort of like activists. So I'm just quoting here from, um, it's a, a, this is quite a useful resource. It's um, something called Animals Farmed and it's a, a, a roundup of sort of like, I think monthly um, animal farming and animal related sort of like content in The Guardian. You can sign up for that. Anyway, so this one was called um, China's Pig Critic Jailed Rescue Sanctuaries and Factory Farming Ban. Right, but this one is about um, floods. So more than a million animals report, more than a million animals, more than a million animals died in flash floods in the Henan province of China, a Reuters report from the village of Wang Fan, where most of the 3,000 residents raise pigs or chickens or grow gra grain, found that at least 200,000 chickens and up to 6,000 pigs, half the, half the villagers heard, had been lost in the floods, the worst in centuries. So more than a million animals died, 3,000 residents, 200,000 chickens, up to 6,000 pigs, half the villagers heard. Those were the captive animals. Presumably the other 500,000, I think it is, it's more than that, isn't it? 300,000, no, it's about 800,000. Well, I, I don't know whether those were so-called farmed animals or uh, free living animals, it doesn't say here. But again, you know, in terms of, you know, we've all seen the reports in places like, I think it was America, wasn't it? Where sort of loads of sheep and cattle were drowning in some kind of floods. I mean, I kind of try not to watch these things, but the impact of, catastrophic climate breakdown, whether it's the heat or whether it's the floods or whatever. And also when it comes to the lack of food, you know, they're going to stop producing food for the so-called farmed animals. And if you imagine what happens when the temperature starts to go up as it has done, and you've got animals inside these gigantic sort of, you know, huge sheds, as we all know, are they going to be suddenly sort of like putting on air conditioning? I don't think so. Uh, they'll just be keeling over. They'll just be keeling over in their God knows how many numbers. So I think, again, you know, the people as, as vegans who are sort of concerned, you know, about all kinds of living beings, this is something to factor in. This is something that's going to be happening more and more and more and more and more. It's already happening. We just don't see it in the news. I mean, you don't see it in the news, do you? Like 200,000 chickens in one village were drowned You just in China. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. But we need to be putting this sort of stuff out. We need to be factoring this in to our own sort of advocacy. So, you know, all, all the statistics we know about so-called farmed animals, we can just take a, a guess and know that huge numbers of them will be affected by whether it's farms, or whether it's, say, if there's a shortage of feedstuffs or by heat waves. This is just the beginning. And I suppose the ironic thing there, in a way, is that in a vegan world, none of those other animals would actually be there in the first place. So that's the thing. They're actually being raised, I imagine, in this situation to actually be used for consumption. So in a way, that, that story, I, I imagine, would be reported in terms of the humans have lost their property, have lost their mm -hmm. livelihood, rather than poor animals have lost their lives and I suppose that's that's a difficult one to um 
to get your head around, isn't it, in a way? Because obviously we really, feel, as as vegans and animal rights advocates, we really feel for those individuals and what they're enduring. But in a way, they ought not to be here in the first place. It's kind of a difficult one, isn't it? But I mean, it's still it's still a legitimate point to make, isn't it? You know exactly what you're saying. It's it's very legitimate to say, you know, well, they 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 all had a right to live, and they 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 were just horribly killed or died. You know, it's it's. I think these are just opportunities to raise the vegan flag, as it were again and it kind of might get a bit boring and a bit sort of like oh god you know is anybody listening but I think you always get that when you're doing advocacy don't you I mean you all you never really know the impacts that you have I mean I was at this group where I've sort of embedded myself which is um, a local sort of like they call it a climate cafe and uh, you know we've had about th we've met about three or four times and then the last time weekly and then the, and I've been sort of like talking when it's appropriate about sort of like other animals and, you know, people are concerned about nature or climate breakdown. Maybe they should consider, you know, like not using other animals. And, you know, to somewhat mixed responses, people basically say, well, yeah, one guy was saying very strongly, well, I used to be vegan. I understand that. I understand all that about the baby chickens being ground up. I said, well, fair enough, you know, but I mean, it's still a point. Anyway, the, the following week, he sort of like happily announced that he'd sort of bought some little uh, vegan some sort of meals and I was like oh my god you know somebody else was sort of like saying oh well I'm thinking about it and took a leaflet that I gave her and somebody else was sort of like saying well you've made me think a lot so I mean you know and who knows what's going to happen next week and even if they you know you don't get sort of like an automatic well I'm a vegan you don't know what happens when they go home or who they talk to that sort of effect that we we've all sort of like talked about we don't know and it's kind of kind of killing well not that it would say killing two birds with one stone but whatever that and what the vegan version version of that analogy is you're doing two things you're sort of like being in a community and you're also sort of like veganizing so i think there are many different ways of approaching this and they seem to be quite open to the conversations as well and the thing is once you once you're in a little group you come back time and time again so they can ask you questions and you can sort of, you know, give them another um, thought about being vegan. Mm. So so um, it, it's probably important for us, like, and I, and I know you're doing a lot of this now, Pamela, being, being in groups and communities where there are a lot of non-vegans because you can come out of the bubble. A lot of that, but... Is everyone hearing that noise? Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where it's coming from though. We could um, we could try muting just to see if we can figure out where it's coming from. I think it was right, Pamela actually. Yeah, I think it was Pamela's um, mic here. Yeah, so. yeah. It's your it's your mic, Pamela. Okay, that's a problem. Um, uh, it, might, it might be better for, for Pamela not to, to to go back to just using the computer um, without the headset if that if her mic's causing. Yeah, if, if that's plugged in, you could maybe yeah. unplug it now. So. Um, but it's interesting what she's talking about because that's a kind of community outreach type thing. And I think this is something that the vegan movement's got to be, get more into. Um, you see, at the moment, what tends to happen is with outreach events is normally people go in the centre of a big city and they do some sort of outreach events. It might be an AV or uh, Earthlings or some other event in the centre of a big city. And they've come from probably you know all around. that they, they, A lot of them may not even live in that city, certainly not in the centre, which is probably just a shopping area. And then they all go away again, and I think that that's that's fair enough. And I'm sure that you know, you know, that does a lot of good. But I think what we've got to start thinking about more is doing our outreach in more local areas and getting more involved mm -hmm. in the communities in those areas. In other words, instead of just kind of doing doing this kind of hit and run street outreach, like kind of doing um, vegan information stalls and kind of food sample giveaways at local community events. 
you know, at, uh, you know, at, at local carnivals, at, you know, at local, you know, lo local fairs, at, uh, at all those things in the local area. And that's what we need to do. We, 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 in order to reach the maximum of people, we've got to kind of um, get even more into the grassroots. We've got to become more localised. In order to do that, one really important thing is that more vegan activists need to become organisers of, of events in their local areas instead of just all going into a big city and standing there, you know, like as a, you know, just as a participant in those events. To actually start thinking, well, how can I organise stuff actually where I live? And if, if people do that, they'll find other vegans that will help them. Because not all vegans are kind of going into the middle of big cities. There are vegans in local areas that are potential activists and that would become active if there's someone in that local area prepared to organise stuff. And I think if we're really going to spread the message everywhere, we've, we've got to become more community-based with our outreach. And that, in, that also in, in includes getting involved in, in groups that we've got affinity with, you know, environmental protection groups, for instance. Um, you know, groups that are concerned maybe with animal rescue and, and, and stuff like that as well. You know, so get, get involved in all, in, in all these groups where, where, where there's, you know, some affinity with what we believe in so that we can get truly embedded in local communities. And I think that, you know, that we, we really need to do that if we're going to spread the message as much as possible. Mm, and that speaks to something actually I was having a conversation about yesterday and that sometimes when people are in communities and you have kind of uh, groups that are set up, say cubes or or whatever it might be that come from outside into the community, some of those people feel like they're being spoken to by outsiders. I had a conversation about this and there was someone in a local area to me who had that exact experience that they felt the the member of the public said Oh, you're coming, you're coming here into my community and you're telling me I should be doing this, I should be doing that, because it felt like that whole kind of, you know, attitude will come and we'll we'll give you the rules and how we think you should be living. Whereas if you're in your community and you're you're working from the inside, then of course you you've got more opportunity to actually speak to people who who are around you, who you know, who are you know community members like you are and you can you you have got more of a an idea of what's what's going on in that community rather than just someone from a completely different area who maybe hasn't got a feel doesn't know what's going on maybe speaks a different lingo you know and comes with these hard rules that you must follow i think it does speak to that kind of element of activism as well doesn't it and also if you operate locally you get to know other vegans, uh, which is on a psychological level is is important, especially for for new vegans. Um, mm -hmm. And plus, people can find you. I mean, they see they see you again and again, and they come to you with questions because they have time to think about it, and they may have genuine questions about it. Uh, it's much harder to to say I'm going to the center of the of the of the city to find them. Like I don't know. On Sunday, when they they do the the event, and there are uh, multiple advantages uh, when you operate, operate locally. So it's coming up to twenty past, folks. I said I'll give you a warning now. Um, Rani, do you do you want to um, leave this thing about food is climate to later, or do you want to have a quick word with it about this now to finish, or or, or what? And then we we'll, we'll come I, back I, next next week and fin finish off. I think. I, I think there's very, very, uh, one very important thing that kind of needs to be said. That kind of um, the climate crisis itself is something that um, vegans and animal liberationists they should be the same people really. Um, uh, it's really important that we do our utmost to combat the climate crisis because of the horrific effect um, that that is having on on other animals. I mean, and, and human and, and human animals as well, but for other animals, it's massively worse. Um, it's important that we do that. Um, and but but I think it's also important that we kind of. Um, we, we we sort of understand that uh, animal agriculture could be having um, a far greater uh, impact on the climate than it is officially recognised. 
I think the IPPC, uh, I think according to them, animal agriculture is probably, it's varied, but it's probably somewhere around about 15%, perhaps a little bit less than that now. Is it 14%? There were different figures, but it's around about that. And that itself is is, is kind of huge. And so someone becoming vegan, if, even if it was that, would, would make a big difference. Um, but there was a, 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 a paper published um, by a group called Climate Healers in, I think, the I think that was in 2019, um, came to the conclusion that the figure isn't 14%, 15%, whatever, nor is it 51%, which was what, what there was some other research that indicated it was 51%. The climate healers say it's 87%. 87% animal agriculture is 87%, uh, bears 87% of the responsibility for the climate crisis. And a big reason for that is because um, what's referred to as opportunity costs. In other words, if we didn't have animal agriculture, how much carbon could be pulled down from the atmosphere from all the places, all the land that's used for animal agriculture, or certainly a large percentage of it, are being rewilded, being allowed to, trees being planted or being allowed to return to forest and so that the carbon could be kind of pulled out of the atmosphere. And if you take that into account, this is what they're doing. They're saying you take that into account, along with some other things. They think, you know, they calculate methane as having a um, a bigger impact than what the IPC, uh, IPPC say, for instance. Um, that that all, all added up together um, equates to animal, uh, animal agriculture being 87% bearing 87% of responsibility for the climate. I mean, that, that figure must be contested, I would imagine, though, running, yeah? It, uh, yes. Uh, um, all these figures are contested to a fro. Mm. And, and, I, and I, I'm i not a scientist. I, I, you know, I can't say for certain whether that is the case or not. But it's certainly something that needs to be put on the table and something that needs to be looked at. It's out there. It needs to be put out there. Um, there's also been... a, 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 a a book written very, very recently by a guy called Glenn Mertzer called Food is Climate. That says very much the same thing. And, and basically what he says is, is that it, it, um, the climate um, healers refer to, um, to the two major causes of the climate crisis as the burning machine and the killing machine. The burning machine is the, um, the burning of, um, um, of, of carbon, um, its emissions, you know, caused by the, the, the burning of various um, forms of carbon, uh, a, and the killing machine, which is animal agriculture. And what Ben Mertz says is, is you know, uh, the killing machine is far, far more responsible for the climate crisis than the burning machine. So what we need to do is we need to shut the killing machine down first, and then we can gradually um, shut down the burning machine. If we shut, just shut down the burning machine, it's not going to be enough. Um, we're still going to have, you know, move towards climate ca catastrophe. If we just shut down the killing machine, that would be enough, even without shutting down the burning machine. That's that, that's what he says. He, 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 he thinks we should shut down the burning machine, but he says that's not a priority because animal agriculture is so much more responsible um, than, than um, the burning of carbon. For the climate crisis. Well, did they include the? the, case, the oh, sorry, I was going to. Do they include the oceans in that? Because I know the the ocean. Yeah, the ocean. A lot yeah, the, yeah, and the, the dead zones and everything. The, the overfishing. Yeah, the fishing. Um, fishing's included in that, in, in the harm that mm. uh, that fishing causes to the ocean, to the ocean's ability to absorb carbon and everything else. Mm. Um, and and so, if that is the case, if, if if this is correct, it changes everything, doesn't it? It changes the whole emphasis. Of, of the movement to combat the climate crisis. And the problem is there's a resistance. You see, see, see this desire to consume other animals is, is so embedded in, 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 you know, well, not just in ordinary people, but in, uh, you know, in the economy, in, you know, in politics, in, in big business and everything. 
that there's obviously resistance to resistance to that. You see, the thing is because you know you could kind of re replace everything with um, um, renewable energy. We can do everything the same, you know, like we can have electric cars and we can everything could be renewable energy. We can kind of carry on living the same, can't we? You know, still eating the steaks and everything, you know. So that's quite appealing, isn't it? <laughs> to people, you know, you just have to change that part of it. Um, but if you have to change your diet, you know, pe many people are very, very resistant to that. But we have to do, we, we, we have to do that, you know. Um, you, know, you know, switching to a vegan diet is 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 massively important, especially if this if 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 this is correct that it is eighty seven percent. And so that's something. Um, not that we shouldn't be trying to stop, um, you know, the, the burning of carbon as well, because that not only does that contribute to the climate crisis, that it causes pollution and has other harmful effects on uh, on other animals as well. But this is the you know th 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 this is this is hugely important both this book and 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 the paper produced by Climate Healers. People go to Climate Healers. Um, website they can find the position paper on animal agriculture and have a read through that it's it, it kind of is is it's kind of fairly technical and i kind of my eyes kind of glazed over a bit reading but as i said i'm not you know i'm not a scientist um but if 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 if, if that's correct what these people are saying is correct it, it, it changes everything well in terms of the statistics and differing statistics i mean this is just sort of like led i know we're winding up now this is just very very clearly led on to the fourth point uh, for um, why animal advocates need to be really clued up on a catastrophic climate breakdown. And this is basically going to be so, uh, saved for the next time, but the toast is that the animal death industry has been basically climate washing the statistics to do with its impact on catastrophic climate breakdown. And there's been a five month um, so, uh, investigative uh, investigation by a news organisation called Beesmog called How the Meat Industry is Climate Washing Its Polluting Business Model. And one of the things they talk about is the different ways that the statistics that are used are collated. And the animal death industry uses the ones that makes it look really like there's a tiny amount of, it contributes a tiny amount to cash profit climate breakdown, whereas independent bodies are sort of like looking at a factor of maybe 20, 30, or 100 times more. Um, and there are different categories, but I can, you know, I can go into that more next time. And the way that this is a concerted strategy, that this has been dreamt up by various ag animal or so called livestock sector and meat industry entities, they've all got together this multi billion pound dollar, whatever entity, and they've dreamt up a very specific strategy to address the dangers of what they see is the challenge to their industry of catastrophic climate breakdown. So it's a, basically it's a misinformation campaign that to some extent is, moral, is somewhat being successful but that's something that once we're aware of it as advocates we can uh, start to address it. It's a very detailed uh, report um, and very interesting actually, really interesting. Yeah, so um, so that's for next time. Uh, so we're we're on um, almost ninety minutes now. So we we ought to we ought to go um, and uh, let people. Brian agrees. <laughs> yeah, Brian. <laughs> oh. Brian agrees. Brian's hungry. <laughs> that's his dinner. <laughs> so um, so thanks for everybody for uh, tuning in, and we shall uh, take up uh, the reins. Can we say that? Um, next week, so I don't think we can say that. No, no, no I don't think no, no. we can. No, no. Um, yeah, what, what, you've, what, committed, what, what, you've committed what, a transgression now. I know, yeah. <laughs> ah, well, I resign. <laughs> so, <laughs> bye, everyone. Right. Bye, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>